Hey everybody, Dr. Pingle here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about hotspot analysis in this uh, notebook lecture. Um, so to get started, I've um, added some data. <clears throat> uh, so this comes from the county health rankings, uh, and I've joined this to a cartographic boundary file and kind of section things out. So all we have here, are the, the FIPS code, the county name, uh, and a measure of income inequality, um, which is described um, at their website uh, here. Um, so basically the idea is they're comparing the income at uh, the 20th percentile, uh, and comparing that to the 80th percentile, and then calculating a ratio. So. Uh, if the 20th percentile was, let's say, 10,000 and the 80th percentile was 100,000, um, then you'd get a figure of 10 because this would be 10 times bigger than that. Um, <clears throat> so if you look through the data, um, if you look through the data, um, we've got numbers right here. We could do a quick sort uh, on that. Um, we've got one county um, that's almost certainly got a bad value here with an income inequality number of zero. Um, so it would probably be a good idea to um, to fix that, but that's uh, that's that's okay. Um, most of the values range from about uh, two and three quarters uh, down to about um, uh, close to nine. Um, so before you start working in something like this, it's always a good idea to get a sense of your data, um, and so this is really no exception. Um, the first thing that we want to do is just quickly symbolize our data, um, and so we're going to do that real quickly here. Um, Symbolizing according to unclassed colors, um, we're going to choose our income inequality variable. Um, that looks something like this um, to get started with. Um, one of the nice things about ArcPro is that it includes a, um, a histogram here in the symbology. And so you can um, kind of change these values a little bit um, to match your distribution, uh, which is a really handy feature. Um, so I'm going to choose this yellow to red, which I like when looking at intensity values. Um, you can see that we've got sort of a, a strange value here, um, which we could, you know, dig in a little deeper to if we were doing a real analysis. Um, I'm going to let that go for now. Um, if you look at this distribution, though, you can see that we don't have much going on um, uh, at this scale. So we've got a we've got a zero value here that's um, probably wrong. And one of the things to pay attention to with this value, though, is that um, if it is wrong, uh, it's important that it's it's marked as a null value rather than a zero value because a zero value is going to be um, included in the calculations, um, and uh, and that would be incorrect. Uh, so we have a couple of different options for um, trying to fix this. We could we could just go in there and try to delete it and see if we can get a null value out of out of it. Um, in some cases, if you look at the um, at the fields. Um, See here. If we click on fields, um, we'll get a look at those. Um, <clears throat> sometimes uh, some of these are going to be allowable to have a null value. Now this one isn't uh, isn't checked. Um, we could try doing a quick recalculation, uh, so we can add a field. And we'll change this to a double. We can add a nice alias here, so income inequality. And uh, we could see if we have an option here to add a, add a null field. Uh, in this case, we don't. So adding this field is actually not going to help us. Um, so we will, uh, we will delete this field back out again. OK. So uh, we don't have a good option here. We could, we could maybe change this alias, though, to something a little more friendly. Okay, um, so we have this zero here that we need to deal with. We, we apparently are not allowed to add a null field, which is not uncommon. Um, and so another option of dealing with this is to, is to make a reasonable guess before we continue with, with our analysis. Um, and so one way to do that is to kind of look at the surrounding counties uh, and see what their values are. Um, so here's one um, with uh, income inequality of 4.228. 
nine. Um, so we're we're kind of hovering right in this right in this area here of um, uh, of of four ish. Um, so we could maybe take the surrounding counties, for instance, and just run a quick calculation on them. Uh, I'm just using Excel here for transparency. Um, so this value again was uh, three point. We'll call it four four. This value is 4.28. This value is 3.92. And that value is 4.18. So our assumption here is going to be that our county's value is going to be equal to the average of the nearby counties. And we would get something like 3.96. Um, so in that case, we can actually come in here, uh, we can edit this 3.96, um, we can save that value. A little bit of a lag here. <clears throat> there we go, we can save that value. And now that's gone into our data set. Um, and we can actually um, re-symbolize uh, back out again. Okay, so now you'll notice that our um, histogram has been recalculated here. Uh, clear our selection. Our, our histogram has been recalculated. Oh, and we can go back. We could um, actually find this value. Um, one, one of the things I didn't mention is you could go into the data set uh, and look for uh, errors. Uh, so this is the ranked measured data from the original data set. Um, and if we scroll to the right, we'll get to where this data came from. So this is our income inequality column. Uh, there's our income ratio that we're using. Uh, and then this was uh, Nevada. Um, oh, which county was that? So this is Eureka County 32011. Um, so it's always good to just verify to make sure that something didn't go wrong with the data set. Um, Something didn't go wrong with the import. Uh, 32011. All right, so here's Eureka County, uh, and you can see that we are indeed missing these. Uh, we are missing these values. So, um, <clears throat> with our with our reasonable guess, um, we've uh, we can now proceed with our our hotspot analysis. Um, We've got our um, histogram generated right here. Um, you can see that it's actually quite skewed. Um, so skewed data is not all that uncommon. We have kind of a lot of low values and then things taper off. So what this is saying is that sort of our, our average income inequality is right here, um, but we have this long tail um, where there are just a very few number of counties with an extremely high number. Uh, and one of the nice things that you can do in symbolization uh, in ArcPro is you can actually drag this back and try to peg these corners um, at similar places in the distribution. Now, this is a little bit, um, you know, there's a there's a lot of subjectivity here in terms of what's uh, what's equivalent. Um, <clears throat> but um, but this is a good way to kind of explore the data and kind of moving these sliders around to get a sense of what's um, going on is, is interesting. So, for instance, um, you can really see these um, spots. Um, which are almost certainly um, uh, urban areas in, in many cases. Uh, I can tell you that in Iowa, um, these two are, uh, are urban areas. Um, okay, so let's run that hotspot analysis and, and see how things go. So why would we run a hotspot analysis in the first place? Um, the reason is, is that um, it can be difficult to sort of discern an overall pattern here. Um, so what we're looking at here are some, some income inequality 
um, you know, broadly here, broadly there, maybe somewhere in here. Um, uh, can we be a little bit more, can we, can we tease a pattern out of this um, that's difficult to see from this data alone? Um, so we're going to use a tool called uh, Hotspot Analysis. Um, so this is going to calculate the Gettys or G statistic. Uh, if we run this, uh, we'll take an input feature class, which is, which is generally speaking going to be a polygon data set, uh, which is why we're working with this here. Um, you have to declare your input fields. So we only have the one, in this case, our income inequality. Um, we have to declare a feature output feature class, as usual. So we'll uh, declare this as uh, hotspot1. Now, these variables are, uh, are going to be the, the kind of most important things in terms of how these are run. So let's just quickly take a look at these, um, uh, at these uh, parameters. So the first one here is the conceptualization of spatial relationships. And essentially, this is going to be how we're going to define part of how we're going to define a neighborhood. Because the basic idea behind this tool is that we're going to look we're going to, for each county. We're going to calculate a neighborhood. Um, so we're going to section off the nearby counties. And we're going to compare that section to the whole thing and try to figure out if that is higher than usual or lower than usual. Um, so it's, it's sort of like applying a buffer. Um, and then comparing the, what's in that buffer to what's out of that buffer to see if those two uh, things are different. Um, so the way in which we define a neighborhood is actually quite um, important here. Um, so this is the conceptualization of spatial relationships, and we've got a lot of these. So some of these should look pretty familiar. Um, we can define things by inverse distance, uh, which basically says that we're going to count a neighborhood, but we're still going to say that the closer you are to me, um, the more we're going to weight that observation. Um, we could use inverse distance squared, um, which is the same thing as inverse distance, except when we square it, we're rapidly, we're much more rapidly dropping off um, the weight. Um, so uh, it says the influence drops off more quickly. Uh, a fixed distance band is going to be the simplest, um, which is to say that we define a distance. Uh, this is more like a buffer. We define a distance. Anything within that distance counts. Anything outside of that distance does not count. Um, so that's that's the, the simplest way of conceptualizing this, and that's the default. Um, you can use a zone of indifference, uh, which is uh, interesting. Zone of indifference says within a certain margin, um, you're the same. Uh, and outside of that margin, we're going to drop off with distance. So it's uh, sort of applying a, a weight of uh, a 1. Uh, to anything that's within this certain zone, uh, the zone of indifference, and then after that, then the, uh, then the weight drops off. Uh, and then finally, we can define it in, in two other ways. We can say can, uh, contiguity edges only, which means my neighborhood is anything that's touching me. Or we could say contiguity edges corners, which is to say that um, anything, um, sorry, contiguity edges only means it has to share a boundary. Contigu contiguity edges corners means um, that it just shares one vertex. Um, so the difference would be something like, uh, especially these western counties, um, whether you would want to count uh, this as a neighborhood of that or not. They don't really share a boundary, but they do share one little vertex right here. Um, so that's kind of what um, the uh, contiguity edges, edges only versus corners um, applies there. The distance method, um, you're almost certainly going to want to leave as Euclidean. Um, Euclidean distance is just normal distance, um, as you would think of it, as the crow flies is the way they put it in the documentation. Um, Manhattan distance is a little bit different. Um, that is, instead of calculating uh, <clears throat> the distance as a straight line distance, you calculate it by um, the sum of the x and y coordinates. So if I was trying to get from this point to that point, um, and let's just pretend that, uh, that this has a length of 3, um, uh, actually, let's pretend this has a length of 3, this has a length of 4, then the diagonal is 5, right? It's a, that would be a classic 3, 4, 5 triangle. Um, Manhattan distance, though, is going to say, well, I can't actually get there directly. I have to go on the roads. Um, so I would have to go uh, 4 and then 3. So the distance between here and there would be 7 uh, rather than 5. Um, it's just a different way of sort of conceptualizing distance. It sort of um, has the effect of... of penalizing um, things that change in both directions. Um, uh, so uh, in practice, that doesn't get used very often, but it's good to have um, heard of that once. Um, 
The distance band or total threshold distance is that it can be calculated for you or you can specify it. Um, it's good to know what this is um, and it's good to have a, a reasonable justification for what you want this to be. So uh, in the notebook, it's good to maybe just let this run um, without specifying it and see what the default turns out to be. Uh, and we'll do that. Um, but then the next thing that you're going to want to do is um, play around with those a little bit and, and get a sense of what they do. So if you're, if you're working within the United States, you know, a, a distance threshold of, and this is going to be set according to your uh, uh, input uh, coordinate system. So that's going to be in degrees. Um, so it's probably good to project this data set before we run it, um, which we'll do. Um, but, um, uh, you know, you certainly want to, wouldn't want to choose something small like 10 meters or even probably one kilometer. Your uh, threshold distance is actually going to be quite a bit larger, but it's going to interact with how your um, uh, how your conceptualization of spatial relationships works. Um, so we'll just run this really quickly uh, with the defaults um, just to sort of see how this goes. This is a fixed distance band, so effectively just a buffer uh, Euclidean distance. Um, the last um, couple of um, uh, ideas here are one, the, the self-potential field. Um, so this is essentially um, uh, whether you want to count, uh, most of the time you'd count yourself as a, as a full weighted number. Um, in some cases, you might not want to do that. That would be super rare, um, but uh, that's what that one does. And then um, applying a false discovery rate is actually fairly important. So the false discovery rate um, is going to correct for the fact that um, if I run a statistical test on every one of these 3,000 um, counties, um, some of the connections that I'm going to see are statistically likely to have been there just by chance. Uh, and so you can apply this correction. Um, my advice is, is don't worry about that too much. Um, it, it, you know, uh, it's kind of getting a bit into the weeds of this. Uh, multiple comparisons can be a problem. Uh, so in other words, running 3000 statistical tests can produce undesirable outcomes or spurious connections. Um, but I probably, um, that, that wouldn't be my first guess. Uh, so um, it's probably okay to leave that uh, unchecked, although you should play around with that uh, in the notebook as well. Um, so we're just gonna run this uh, with the default settings, just to get a sense of um, the tool outputs here. And what we get is a pattern that looks something like this. Um, so this is a map telling us where are the neighborhoods uh, statistically high and where are the neighborhoods statistically low. Um, so you can see that we're getting some fairly large trends of statistical uh, significance here in the south uh, and in uh, Appalachia uh, and uh, in um, kind of the, the mid-Atlantic through the, the uh, New England, so you can see Massachusetts right here, showing up uh, as um, high income inequality. On the other hand, um, you can see um, relatively low income inequality, oh, and, and the Bay Area, right? So San Francisco kind of notably showing up here as a high income inequality spot. Lots of very rich people, um, uh, a few very rich people and, and a few very poor people. So that's what's showing up here. Um, in contrast, we've got a, um, a cold spot. So these are places where you're getting uh, less income inequality um, than you would predict given the sort of overall average. So um, kind of the area in through uh, Pennsylvania and Maryland is showing up as a cold spot. And then huge portions of the Midwest are showing up as um, cold spots as well. So this is where income inequality would be the lowest um, or where incomes um, are the most even. Um, so what I would encourage you to do is, is play around with these different, um, uh, uh, different parameters and settings and sort of see what they do, see how they change your answer. Um, changing the symbology can definitely change the story, um, but just because you're using a statistical test doesn't mean that it can't be manipulated. Um, and, uh, and so you should understand how those manipulations take place um, in order to better spot um, you know, how you can be as truthful as you can to the data and how you can be as honest as you can in your reporting and analysis.